When Orin realized it was going to be a difficult night, when she stepped into the east parlor to do a bit of light dusting and found it on fire. Shops and mercers, she said as a spray of hot embers erupted from the fireplace. There were, there were plenty of other rooms in the enormous Vidalia estate that might have burst into flames. Like the empty bedrooms upstairs kept for guests who never arrived, or the pantry with its thousand pieces of silver, which had to be polished even though no one used them, and she might not have minded one bit. Instead, the room that had caught fire were the east parlor, Honorine's favorite room in the house. It was full of strange and delightful artifacts, books and bones, dolls and craft tasks, insects peeing inside shadow boxes, and last cases of dead birds stuffed with oil cotton, all acquired by Lord Vidalia on his extensive travels. She quickly set down her dusting rags and lantern and went to work putting out the flames. Don't worry, sir, Honorine muttered as she stamped on the smoldering rug with the worn heel of her boot. I'll save your treasures. Lord Vidalia, as always, did not reply. He simply watched from the painting over the mantel where he sat ever silently with his beautiful, elegant wife and their infant son, Francis, on the deck of a ship surrounded by dark water and thousands of stars. It had been painted in 1879 according to the signature scroll in the lower corner of the canvas and was the only existing portrait of all three Vidalias together in the same frame because shortly after it finished, Lord Vidalia vanished. Honoring hurried to get to every errant spark, stumbling across the furniture, the display cases, and the mountain specimens of animals packed into the huge and terribly cluttered room. She tripped over a red fox as she stomped out on the rug, then grabbed the nearest vase of fresh cut roses, snuffed a burning ember in the mane of a red Barbary lion, and ran straight under the belly of a giraffe to toss the contents of vast water, roses and all, into the snarling fireplace. The flames expired at once, hissing out a tremendous ball of sooty smoke. Honorine winced as it washes as it washed over the oil painting <coughs> above the mantel. She grabbed a broom and waved it about to clear the air. Who was supposed to be tending the fire anyway? she asked. But the specimens declined to reply. Fires burned throughout the night even in the empty rooms of the manor house, because Lady Vidalia kept strange hours and was deathly afraid of the dark. But fires were always to be attended, no matter how tedious a chore it might be. This was the inspiration for Honoris Lantern, a device of her own design and making. With more electric light, there would be less need for open flames burning all over the house and many fewer hours spent waiting around in otherwise empty rooms. Her latest prototype included a voltaic power battery powering a squat light bulb, which sat inside the glass chimney for an old kerosene lamp. Which, with the fire now out, Honorine picked up her little lantern to inspect the damage. To her relief, the painting was unharmed, 
The Vidalia family looked exactly as they always did. Lord Vidalia, noble and dignified, with thick streaks of grey in his hair. Lady Vidalia, luminously beautiful, with her burnished bronze skin and her black hair, a magnificent crown of waves and ringlets, set with shimmering green gemstones. The baby Francis, sitting on his father's knees, with a bundle of white lace with a round little face and huge brown eyes. Nothing above the fireplace seemed to be burnt beyond repair, but there was something else that troubled her. The mantle was empty, and what happened to Lord Vidalia's things? Honoring said with a scowl, his hat and gloves and sword usually rested under the family portrait. She peeked quickly into the cavernous fireplace, worried that the heap of charcoal and ash might be the gloves and hat, but there was no sign of the sword, and that shouldn't happen to dust even if it had been tossed into the flames. The rest of the room seemed undisturbed until she came to the little alcove containing Lord Vidalia's old writing desk, surrounded by framed charts of the sea and the stars. Someone had rifled through the desk, leaving doors ajar and drawers hastily shut with corners of parchment sticking out like sharp little tongues. Honorine found the missing items from the mantel on the floor beside the desk, along with a handful of odd black feathers and several small books dropped in a careless pile. Honorine placed the sword and the gloves gently back on top of the mantel, and then after a quick peek around to see that the room was still empty, she placed the hat over her dark red hair, picking up her broom to sweep the hearth. She imagined that instead of Hanlick standing in the parlor, she was railing up Lord Vidalia's ship looking down at the golden sand of an uninhabited beach, ready to jump into the surf and charge ashore. When the broom straws brushed over something odd lying in the ashes, it was another small boat with one of her dusting rags. Honorine brushed the wet suit from the, tro- from the cover. It was similar to the books on the floor, near the writing desk, bound in soft leather, roughly the size and weight of a deck and playing cards. The cover bore the image of a pointed crown with star-shaped jewels set by the tips. It seemed familiar, but it didn't belong in the parlor collection. She had cleaned it and tended every item in this room dozens of times, and she certain she was certain it never seemed she had never seen this book before. Honorary gingerly opened to the first page. Vidalia filled a monarch of the celestial constellations, both known and extinct. This was mostly nonsense to Honorary, except for one word constellations. Being a sailor, Lord Vidalia had plenty of maps and charts of the sky all over Manor House. Following the patterns of the stars was a very reliable way to navigate on the vast open sea, where there was no reeds or landmarks to follow. Francis had been much more interested in the subject than Honorine, but she knew many of the constellations by name. She and Francis had spent plenty of evenings and early mornings locating the patterns in the stars as Francis attempted to learn oceanic navigation from a bench in his mother's rose garden. Honorine was more interested in the myths of the creatures and heroes themselves, the scorpion, the archer, 
the crow and the legend about how they got their names and places in the sky. But Lord Vidalia had few books on such subjects in his libraries. His work was much more practical in nature than Francis was only interested in the subject as it related to sailing. Honorine ran her thumb along the pages, which stuck a bit because of the wet water of the water and singed edges. When she eventually managed to pry them apart, she stared at the open book in amazement. Gorgeous illustration of fantastic beasts, Dallop and Claude and saw through the enchanting enchanted sky. Beautiful spotted bulls and golden lions, shining silver serpents and tall black eagles, satyrs, centaurs, unicorns and dragons, all painted with ghost snarling expression in shimmering iridescent ink. She put her fingers back from the page, almost afraid to touch them. Honoring snapped a stern voice behind her. What are you doing? Honorine quickly tucked the book in her apron, pocketed and flashed pink as she turned around to face Agnes, the head parlor. Dusting, she replied, tipping her head back to see Agnes' face under the brim of Lord Vidalia's voluminous head. As you requested, there was a small problem with the fireplace. But I was, I saw to it promptly. We might want to get someone to sweep that chimney. I believe the flu may be stopped. Agnes shook her head almost imperceptibly as she stood with her arms tensely at her side and her mouth tightened into an impressively sour pucker. Take that off, she demanded looking over her shoulder before snatching the head off Honorine's head and replacing it on the mantle. It's only a head, Honorine said. Agnes wiped her hands hastily on her apron as, she, as if the head had left a residue on her fingers, and Eve thought it was only an apple. Agnes replied, <coughs> They're rolling her eyes, in warning, these are not playthings. If you have time for nonsense and foolishness, then I, then I haven't given you enough work. Then she noticed the fine burns on the rug and the last thin crawl of black smoke still twisting over the edge of the mantle. Oh, honoring, she clutched her heart as she. Examine a peppering of thing, sink spots across the top of the cherry wood cabinet, starch marks on the furniture, burns on the rugs. Was this lion on fire? Only briefly, Honorine replied, "He's fine now." And did that have anything to do with this? With all this, Agnes pointed accusing at Honorine Slanton. No, Honorine insisted. It was the fireplace, I promise. And just look at the state of your uniform. Honorine looked down at her smart grey woolen dress and her white apron trimmed in lace. Once crisp and bright, now splattered and smeared with black ash and flakes of soot. Oh, bother and bobtails, she said as she battered at the dirt on the hem of her apron. She rather liked her uniform. The dress matched her grey eyes, and she even had a bit of grey velvet ribbon to tie back her hair. It was nothing as fancy as Lady Fidalia's gown, but it was far better than the damn sticky clothes one had to wear to work down in the kitchen or laundry. Agnes took a very deep breath and exhaled slowly, bringing one brittle hand to her tired eyes. Do you know what will happen if you lose your position here, Honorine? Yes, Agnes, Honorine sighed. It will look 
It will be straight to the mills for me. She had heard it from Agnes many times before, and from the other help, though they mostly stayed far clear from of her. No other manor house would take her in when she had worked for the Vidalias. The house was known to be cursed or haunted, or at the very least, bad luck, and the other fine families in town were deathly afraid that servants from the Vidalia Manor would bring the ghosts in with them. That's right, Agnes added, where you would work twelve hours a day in the weaving room, crawling on the hot floor under the looms to gather up the cotton lint to be spun into cheap yarn, Honorine continued. That's right, Agnes said again with a firm stump of a boat's heel on the wooden floor. That's where I worked when I was your age, not waltzing around about a grand manor house in, fr in a fine dress. You are only working upstairs at the request of Lady Vidalia herself. So I have done my job dutifully, even though it had been far too much work for me to keep you presentable up here, where you might be seen by dress. Yes, Agnes, Honorine said, and thank you. However, in all her years at the Vidalia estate, Honorine had never seen anyone come to visit except servants and other persons hired by Lady Vidalia, mostly doctors and mystics and fortune tellers. They were shown up to the chambers in the west wing, where Lady Vidalia lived mostly in seclusion, surrounded by protective amulets and tel talismans. After Lord Vidalia's disappear disappearance, Lady Vidalia began collecting all manner of trinkets to counteract the curses and jinxes she thought must be hanging over the house. She had bundle of herbs hung over the doors and mystical runes carved into the stone turrets in the high brick fence around her property. She even had protective rocks she thought omen stones strung up and draped like garlands in every window and doorway in the house, in the tables over the gates in the fence, and across the glass roof of the old nearly abandoned greenhouse out on the grounds. The stones resembled, resembled thick broken yellow green glass strung on tangled silk lines given the effect of spider webs heavy with insect carcasses. I still think it was a mistake. Agnes continued to lecture as she moved about the room, but it's too late now to change it. The downstairs help wouldn't have you anyway, even if they do need the extra help. She pulled back the heavy drapes and opened a window to air out the stench of smoke and burn silk, honoring gaps. The omen stones were glowing. Agnes's face drained to pale grey. She snatched the curtain slows. How are they doing? That Honorine asked, watching the faint light shine out around the edge of the velvet drapes. Where is the light coming from? Have they ever done this before? But Agnes for once said nothing at all, not even to stroll. Her silence chilled Honorine right down to the bone. Suddenly a great deep boom like a distant explosion rattled the windows and made the old house tremble. Agnes, honoring us in the thinness of whisper, what are omen stones? Omens of honoring words settled like falling ash, and the whole house went still and silent. She could hear only her own breathing. After another moment of quiet, Agnes snapped back to attention. 
go up to your room, find something clean and acceptable to wear, and take your filthy uniform down to Jane so it can be clean before tomorrow, she spouted. But what was that? Honorine asked. What's happening with the stones? The next time I see you, I expect you to be pre- presentable, Agnes continued. Her stoning skills returned to full form. Do not make me tell you a second time. Honorine stayed half a, a moment longer in protest and nodded and started across the room. Agnes went out the modest door, tucked away at the back of the parlor into the servants' hallway, which allowed maids and footmen to have minimal interaction with guests and the upstairs residents. Such hallways travelled like arteries up and down the interior of the house, though they were rarely used in the mostly empty manner. Honorine guided her lantern and dusting rags. A little bit upset with Agnes, she must have known what would make the omen stones glow, as if they were electrified. Well, Agnes could issue all the orders and chores she wished, rocks magically turning into light bulbs was not the kind of thing Honorine could simply ignore. It was the kind of thing she planned to investigate immediately. Then the noise began. A great knocking started overhead as if someone was stumping about in huge heavy boots down at the farthest end of the upstairs hall. The sound grew louder and closer until the chandelier in the parlour began to shudder with each step. Then the knocking simply stopped, vanishing like a snuff-out flame. Honorine felt her heart hammering in her chest as she waited and listened. All was still until she raised her boot to take a step toward the parlor door. A second sound echoed through the house. This was lighter and faster, like the feet was of a galloping animal racing down the hallway, overhead, then down the stairs then onto the polished marble floor of the foyer. Hot nails rattled on the smooth stone as the unknown creatures raced straight toward the parlor. Honorine extinguished the lantern light and shrank down to the floor, crouching behind the stout front paws of the Barbary lion. Out in the foyer, she could see stones beginning to glow in the huge arch window over the front entryway. Across the hall, the dark sitting room was also peppered with tiny spots of faint yellow-green light. The footfalls on the marble floor slowed to a walk. The stones began to burn brilliant yellow. Then the footfall stops. The creatures in the foyer howled. But at least her howl was the closest honoring could come to describing the wild ghostly call. It echoed down the cavernous hallways, rattled the windows, and cut through honoring like a shot of ice cold water. When the howl faded away, the house was silent. Honoring looked up to see the stones fading back from pure golden yellow to a deeper yellow green as fast as she dared and as suddenly as she could manage, Honorine hurried to the doorway and cautiously peered into the dark foyer. The marble floor was bare and shining as always, but leading up the carpeted stairs was a trail of paw prints cinched into the silk fibers of the rug, still smoldering hot orange around the edges. Her eyes traveled up the grand staircase to the first landing, and its huge leaded glass windows also covered with web of glowing stones. One window though was wide open, honoring slipped out of the parlor 
and snout silently up the steps, carefully stepping around the burning paw, paw prints in the rug. Each one was enormous lot larger than her hand, with all her fingers stretched out to very widest. They led directly to the open window and then stopped abruptly, as if the creature that made them had leaped out, taking a rather bold two-story plummet onto a solid stone patio below. Cool evening air blew in the open window, pushing something off the window sill and onto the carpet at Honoring's feet. It was a feather, a black feather with an iridescent sheen of purple and green that swelled across the surface like oil, spreading across dark water, honoring plucked it from the ground, remembering the black feather near Lord Vidalia's writing desk. But as she tried to make sense of the paw prints, the howling, the open window, and now the feather, it began to dissolve into violet embers, like the edge of the paper curling as it caught fire. There was no heat, just a brief, faint glow. As the feather crumbled into fine ash, the stones in the window went dark, the smoldering paw prints extinguished across the rug, and Honorine was left with nothing but soot-stained fingertips.